Welcome to Own It, the podcast where we talk to real estate thought leaders about embracing your strengths, taking your career to new heights, and owning your future. I'm Hillary Saunders, co-founder and chief broker officer at SIDE, and joined along with my very thoughtful co-host, Spencer Kroll. Hi, thank Spencer. You, Hi, Hillary. Th- thoughtful. It's very, that's very thoughtful of you to say, so thank you. You're very welcome. But you know what we get to talk about today? Lots of thoughtfulness and lots of economic genius behind our guest, Leslie Appleton Young, who I am thrilled. She's one of my mentors, along with many other women in the industry. I know look up to her in her illustrious career, which is is very vast and deep. And there's so much that accolades that I could give her ahead of time. But I think we just bring her on and we dive right in. So welcome to Own It, Leslie. I'm so grateful to you for joining us today. This is awesome. Hillary, I'm delighted to be able to be with you and Spencer and Mike uh, today. And I'm, I'm, I'm an open book. I'm interested to see what you want to talk about. Oh my gosh. Well, you are one of the first women in the real estate industry to really make an impact on, I think, how to interpret economic data. You started out your career, you know, with a stint at the Federal Reserve, which is beyond mind boggling. And I want to learn about that first, if you don't mind. How did you even decide to go that direction? Well, you know, it's really interesting. I was in graduate school at the University of Pennsylvania, and there was a woman who was in our department named Anita Summers, and she just actually um, passed away. But if I look back on my career, I think she was absolutely one of the key uh, key mentors um, in my my life. Larry Summers is her son. They had three three sons. Her husband was chairman of the economics department at that time. And she was doing research at the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia and recommended me to be a research assistant. So that is how that, that happened. It's incredible. And most recently, or I would say you are most well known for being the chief economist for California Association of Realtors. Where did your, or I'm going to assume that you love data and analyzing it, (laughs) otherwise you wouldn't have spent umpteen years doing it. But where did that love and passion come from? You know, I don't think I love data as much as I love stories and I love understanding how things work and how the world got from point A to point B. And I'm very interested in informed uh, analysis and informed opinions. And I am very not interested in an opinion that just came out of nowhere, which are very easy to find um, in this day and age. I think it's really important to look at what actually happened and have numbers to back it up and then to take your analysis from there instead of, well, I thought I heard, or this is what I think and whatever. So um, I became interested in economics right away uh, in college because I felt like it was the umbrella major for history and sociology and statistics and, of course, economic for life. You know, it really explained, you know, when guns, germs and steel came out 20 years ago, it was like, oh, my goodness. You know, there's a way of understanding how we got here. And that really excited me. So it wasn't the data as data, it was really what can that tell us and what's the story, you know, because people don't remember the the number, you know, what they remember and what helps them is a story around it so they can adjust going forward easily, right? You, you actually got me very excited about economics. For anybody that's listening, I don't think they understand, like people would at, at the California Association of Realtors Conventions, um, people would line up and make sure to get in to the lunch that where you were speaking would present your presentation. You'd present your presentation. That's great. Anyway, where you would be presenting. Right. And, 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 but I mean, I, I just want people to understand. It's like, it's like, like fights would break out in line. Like, no, I want to get the seat, you know, up front. Your stuff. Well, all right. No, arguments. Like people would get a little snippy. But you, the, when you're talking about a story, you present the stuff so in such an interesting manner. And I think what people... Uh, I might not get, and and I'd love to hear you talk about it, is you were dealing with not only data, but you're also dealing with consumer sentiment, 
right? Like, like you're putting it all together on this one, what, 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 like shelter is like the, you know, like shelter food. And I don't remember what the other one is, um, but you know, one of three main pillars. So how did you, like, like how did you learn about sociology involved in that with consumer behavior? Well, and, and all I that? think the economics profession kind of grew up. And I think Robert Schiller at Yale really was one of the, the people that was just, I was actually his research assistant for a little while um, at the Fed, but it was all, you know, numbers and analytics. And then everybody realized that, well, you've got this really great Marshallian theory about maximizing your utility curve on a budget constraint, but guess what? People don't act that way. <laughs> and so we've, this whole new field, all of a sudden got um, got a lot more interest because it was what are people actually doing? And so you have situations where I'm, we were always watching the consumer confidence index and like the economy would be great and the index would be going down. You know, like why do people feel so bad when the economy really is great? And it has to do with all the other things that impact how people respond to those kinds of questions. So that's kind of a, a short, a short answer there, but I, I am very heartened to see all of the resources that over the last couple decades have been spent looking at actually how people behave in markets because it's not always the partial derivative tells you everything. So <laughs> to that point, with listeners who are realtors across the country, and there's so much noise with headlines and attention grabbing stats and all sorts of stories that the pundits tell to gain, you know, um, viewership. Where should the the top producer realtor actually get their legit information from? Like, where should they go? Well, I've, I'm a New York Times, Wall Street Journal person, you know, every day we actually get those papers delivered in paper form uh, to our home. And I think it's really important to invest in um, in that kind of an ongoing education, because one of the things obviously that's always drawn me to side was just the quality of the entrepreneurs that want to want to hang their shingle under under side. And they're working with intelligent you know, people, <laughs> and you've got to learn to speak, speak that language. And you just have to pick a couple of sources that you trust, right? And maybe across a spectrum, whatever. So you just can't get overwhelmed. You know, you've really got to pick and choose. And maybe every six months you evaluate it and people that you admire in the industry, kind of ask them, what are you listening to now? What's been the most helpful and kind of adjust the tertiary sources um, as the market as the market changes. But I think you really do need to be comfortable talking about, you know, the stock market and what's happening to housing prices and and inventory. I mean, that's kind of the bread and butter of the industry. Paul, Paul Krugman, what do you think? Good, bad? Oh, I think he's wonderful. Okay, good because I, I like him. I really, yeah, no, I like I like Krugman um, a lot. I mean, nobody's right all the time, and it's one of the reasons why the Journal and the New York Times are really good to read because you get the same topic and you can you get a little bit of a different slant uh, in each each publication. And also, the Economist coming out of um, uh, the UK is mm -hmm. is worth. Um, worth a read, um, but you got to stay focused or Hillary, as you said, you just are going to be overwhelmed and not out there using it in your conversations with clients. I think that's a skill set too, right, Spencer? I mean, chime in here if you if you disagree. It's it's a translation piece, right? You take the data, which is why I think, Leslie, you've been so instrumental in this space because you're taking data and your storytelling, which then the realtors are very good relationship people, and they can then go to their clients. So how how do you guide people in digesting the information that they're getting and then translating it to the average buyer seller who's out in the market? You know, I think it's the basic uh, where I would start was quit thinking about yourself as just a relationship person. Think of yourself as an educator. 
think of yourself as the best listener. You know how I am about listening. The best listener in the in the office, right? And see where the the voids are, the shortcomings are in terms of them struggling with a decision or not understanding how the peaks and valleys go, whatever it, whatever it is. But think of your role as educating them to make the best decision for them with the knowledge that's available um, at the time. And if you just keep that focus, it'll really help you kind of sift through um, a lot of the extraneous material, right? Because you're going to, not everybody's going to be invested in the stock market and want to just talk to you about that, <laughs> you know, and all their other investments. You know, everybody's got a unique situation. But I do think the role of the realtor is to bring those key pieces of information that are missing and put them together, right, in a way that they can move forward. Is there a place that you recommend for summaries? Because there's so much information out there. And so I, you know, I would look at the bond market and, and people don't understand yield curves or something necessarily. And so yeah. where, where well, would you go just to get an overall overall look? Is there well, like every one? Sunday, the New York Times and the business section does a review of what happened that week. Right. And it's usually five stories and it takes maybe six minutes to read and kind of brings you up to date on, you know, rates did this, consumer confidence did this, the you know, whatever uh, the um, labor numbers, employment obviously is very important to real estate. So I've always found that um, extremely useful. And again, to mention the Wall Street Journal, I just love the fact that they start an article on page one and it continues on page A2. You know, so it's, it's, it's really not, once you get into the rhythm of this, it's not a huge investment in time, but it really keeps you. Um, keeps you updated. I also do follow Keeping Current Matters, which I think they do um, a really good job with with data and with all the mi with misconceptions that are out there and kind of say, no, but look at the numbers. Look what look, look what's happened to prices over the last 30 years, because sometimes it really helps people to get that 30,000 altitude view and get them from being stuck in the weeds so much. So I think KCM does a good job with that. Speaking of that particular topic, I think it's very, it's a very timely discussion, right? With interest rates being where they are now. However, if you hadn't been a realtor in the market, you know, 07, 08, 09, and experienced that whole economic turbulent time, this is like earth shattering to you. What advice do you give to someone who maybe doesn't have that 20 year history of being in the industry and seeing how um, cycles occur and give them guidance on calm down. It's okay. The sky is not falling. <laughs> this too shall pass or we will adapt. How do you, how do, what do you say to those people? I think I would just go back to 2007, 8, 9. And how many of us don't wish it was 2009 again <laughs> and we could pick up some properties? I remember in January of 09, what, 60% of the homes sold in California were REOs. Um, what's the other old saw that the best time to re buy real estate was 10 years ago? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I think what's What's most convincing though, and I, I always kind of go back to inventory. You want to know what the market's going to be in six months. Look at what inventory is, um, is today and just how tight it is, right? And all of the reasons for that, you know, including boomers, boomers not, not selling and builders not being able to build because of NIMBYs and all of that, um, all of that stuff. And, Honestly, that's provided a fairly firm footing for housing prices, which are still like the data that came out this week. We're up like 2% year over year, something like uh, that was the core logic number. Um, so I, I think that is a real uh, a real game changer, you know, and I, I remember when I started at CAR, I knew nothing about housing. So I got all of these like tips and tricks. And one was like a normal market has a six month supply of homes on the market. And for the last 12, 13 years, it's been three. 
and now it's probably less than that. So I don't know how much more of a compelling argument. And honestly, the problem with the market right now isn't that people don't want to buy. Right? I think it's really um, the affordability piece um, is, is tough. And while you can say, look, if you can eke it out, you can always refi when rates go down. But I just would be careful with that argument, you know, because yes, at some point they will, but you can't you know, we're in uncharted territory. So um, I, I do think 2008 and nine isn't ancient history. You know, most of us remember it one way or another. And that's kind of the analogy that I would go for. I'm just curious, you made a, you made a shift from the Fed and which I'm assuming was incredibly valuable to learn about the, the workings there. Um, how do you see, like, like, what was the shift you had to make to deal with CAR in particular, to deal with the housing economy as opposed to the overall economy? Well, in a way, it was um, a lot easier because your focus was, you were really focused. Um, although I will tell you, at the time I started at CAR in 1984, we commented on every Fed regulation change that came out. I mean, it was a very different... <laughs> It was a very different world in our small research department. But it was really nice to just have a great, you know, a kind of a boundary. And you you knew the stuff you needed, you, you know, you knew what you needed to learn. And then as you kind of grow into the job over time, it expands and you start to see other connections and so on and so forth. So I was really... Um, I was really delighted. I was back in Los Angeles with a one-year-old and I was a single mom and I was um, just thrilled to get a job that I could use my, um, you know, my background um, in economics and research. I actually worked for a, um, a kind of a brilliant guy, Ira Magaziner in, in Providence, Rhode Island for about a year before I came home. So that was a really interesting experience too. But then to come in and just have all these tools that I could kind of revamp and just get going on housing was really pretty exciting. I mean, I've, I've had a very charmed life in terms of my career. It was just the best thing that could have happened to me was uh, answering. I mean, I still remember, I didn't even have a resume. I had to have a resume typed up and I mailed it in and then I got a call and I came in and I interviewed with uh, Kathy Spiller and then with Joel and, you know, it just was so antiquated <laughs> compared to the way things work now, but it was a great day for me. Turned out best decision ever. You made inroads in a traditionally male dominated industry and also in, I mean, economics, traditionally male dominated, and then real estate also traditionally male dominated. And I know that you have a very big passion for women in leadership and supporting women who want to be entrepreneurs. And I'd love to hear your story on your rise at CAR and ultimately as the co-founder of Woman Up, which is a ma ma magnificent movement within the real estate space. Well, you know, I was mentioning earlier how uh, lucky I was. And when you look at the economics profession in terms of academia, it is incredibly male dominated. And one of the um, presentations I gave uh, a couple years ago at Women Up was really trying to understand why these incredibly successful, talented female brokers just cringe at the thought of being called a feminist. Whereas I was like, I am a feminist. You know? And so I did kind of a compare and contrast the economics profession, which at that time, the American Economic Association finally did a survey and over half of the women um, said they had experienced sexual harassment of some kind at the um, annual meeting where the newly minted PhDs um, interview, you were typically up in a guy's bedroom sitting on the bed, mm. you know, being, you know, but what really kicked it off was a senior at Berkeley uh, in economics did a um, senior thesis where she looked at the job board comments for the newly minted PhDs. And this got a lot of, a lot of press because the men were, you know, 
knowledgeable and this and, you know, very professional. And the women, it was kind of body parts, pregnancy, um, all of all of that that you can imagine. It was terrible. And it really woke the profession up. And this was just a few years ago. So I I contract. And so that's why, you know, and these people had control over the future of your career. Whereas let's face it in real estate, go out and sell. Let me mm -hmm. see your numbers. No one's telling you there's no glass ceiling there. You know, no one's telling you, you can only sell this many houses this year. And women speak housing. They speak home. Right? <laughs> and they're really, they're really good at it. And it was just an amazing thing. You know, when I became kind of took over Joel's job in 1989, nobody thought it was weird that there was a woman up there talking about the market because over half of the women in the audience, people in the audience were female. And that was just an amazing thing. So am I a strident feminist? I absolutely am. You know, I, I, I just know too much not to be. But do I understand why women I'm very close with aren't using the same language? I absolutely understand that, too. So um, I think I'm in the age of my life where I'm just seeking to under understand, you know? <laughs> yeah. And you ask questions and I find it so helpful. So just as an aside, a really short read, we should all be feminists. Um, is if it's based on a TED talk, it's wonderful. Um, and there's a lot of good takeaways in there that the, the underlying support and encouragement for women being their own entrepreneurs, being their own bosses and just killing it in the industry is I think supported, but the term feminist for whatever reason has this, you know, potential negative commentation, which I think we should do a lot of work to change. You know, that's the other thing. At my age, I'm not looking to change anybody, but I will tell you, I just feel so, I'm so committed to helping women, whatever it looks like and whatever they call themselves, um, to be comfortable with power. You know, growing up in the 50s and 60s, it was all about being small, you know, don't, don't make waves make sure everybody else is okay. And, you know, it's, um, and the men were all about, we're going to win. And, you know, and so I love men be men, women be women, but let's all have an opportunity to, you know, be who we, who we really can be, you know, I mean, I've had, and thank you for saying a successful career. And I think I have, but I felt like I had the brakes on half the time. And what if I had really wanted to be successful? What if I had really wanted to? I was very, very comfortable and always grateful to be Joel's number two, you know, in, in the economic. Absolutely. But what if I had, you know, <laughs> what if I'd really wanted to be successful? And uh, it just uh, it's really tough when you grow up in a, you know, in a different world. You know, I, I grew up uh, in uh, in the so I'm probably ten years behind you, I guess, because I grew up with Helen Reddy, right? You know, of, of I Am Woman, and and the ERA and all that stuff, Billie Jean King, and all those things that were going on. And there's the ERA there's, that there's, still hasn't been passed. Well, by the I, way. I I know. I think I think Rhode Island finally just passed it or something. I can't remember what state it was. I was like, oh great, only forty years too late. Um, but there, but there, but it was, well, it's interesting because there's the there's the performative aspect of it where there's lip service being given and then there's things that actually happen. And I, I got to say, one of the things that, that impresses me thinking about it now, uh, I got into real estate in 2003 and who did I see? You know, I, you know, I, I saw you and, and you see people like, like June Barlow. Uh, now I'm just talking about California association right now, but, but uh, Sarah Sutton and, and, and Jennifer Branchini, who, who, you know, were president, uh, like, like in my mind, it's like, where are the men, right? You know, I mean, I, mean, I, I, I and, and I'm, I'm kidding you, you when I say that, but we you, left you, them in the dust. <laughs> but you did, but, 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 but I mean, but I mean, Leslie, you were the face. Like you, you were, you were the, the person, you know, out, out in the front. And, and I just think, it, it, so you said something uh, when I was reading a little bit about uh, prepping for this. That if you're going to be uh, a leader, you have to feel, you have to feel comfortable with people being upset with you. And I love that concept. And I'm wondering if you can talk about that. You know, I think this is something that is a challenge for a lot of women, because, again, the way 
we were raised and I think it's changed. I have a five-year-old granddaughter here in Atlanta and I am just absolutely delighted to see what I, you know, this spirit and, and so on. And I hope it survives, um, survives puberty, but it's just not easy to kind of get through it when you've kind of raised a certain way. And so the fact that I was able in my career, and honestly, I'm an okay economist. I'm not a great economist. I look at Jordan um, Levine, who took you know, took over from me, Robert Kleinheads before him, and much greater skills at the dashboards and the pivots and all of that. Um, and so I'm so proud of them. And I think what I brought to the table was the storytelling was a good, a really good idea of what mattered and what didn't. So let's kind of focus on what matters, you know, we, no, I'm not trying to show you how smart I am. I'm trying to give you information that you can impart to your clients and help you be a more successful um, entrepreneur. And I think I understood that intuitively and it's why people wanted to hear um, what I had to say and would remember things. And again, it's not about the second derivative, you know, it's really about where are we in the cycle and what are people looking for and what are their fears and how can we make this happen? And it's, it's pretty basic stuff, but people get confused. You know? They don't focus. For those who are at the precipice or desiring to go out on their own and be their own broker owners, because I know that is also a passion of yours to in you know, give them the opportunity to do that and be their own, their own business owner. What do you say to people who are on the fence or guidance that you have? Maybe they have limiting self beliefs or something of that nature. What kind of wisdom can you instill to those folks? Well, I think they've got to do a fearless inventory of what they're good at and what they need to be good at in order to be successful. And I know at side, you are the umbrella for all of incredibly successful entrepreneurs. And I know you have resources to share about what you need. And you guys provide the back, this beautiful back end. You know, I, <laughs> I met Guy and I was like, oh my God, what a great concept. I'm so excited. Um, you know, you've got that data and that information for them. And they may not be ready, right? They may not have um, enough experience or people bringing. They may not be good at whatever it is, you know. Um, and to do that analysis, get you know, get advice from others, and then kind of create a create a plan. You know, no change, no change. You know, here is where I want to be, and I need to find out about you know the financial um, ebbs and flows of a of a real estate business. I need to find out about taxes. I need to know a little bit more about um, investment. I need to know about social media, and just get those rocks. And some you may check off and say that's working for me, I'm good, and others you're not. So get the help you need because there may be a reason why you're on the fence, but also realize that, you know, sometimes you just got to jump, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, this is a thing about women. Like they always say like, oh, I'm not ready. I'm not going to be perfect. I remember turning down managing a new department at, at CAR back in the day because oh, Joe, I just don't think I'm, I'm ready. I don't think I would be great. You know, and it's like, oh, my God, if I had that again today, I'd be hmm. bring it on. I can do it. You know? how, how important do, do you think it of, is, obviously, mentorship, because you can't know it all on your own. And I think it's really important, other than reading a book or watching a video, is having someone you can actually speak to. I'm in a mastermind group, and, and I know yes, uh, as a woman up, I think is a great is really great for that because it's people who are doing you know and it's bringing people up um how important is it do you think that your mentor is a woman when you're a woman in business 100 percent. i don't think that's your only mentor i think there are brilliant men doing great things that you can get information from and i i think this idea of mentor realize how porous it is i mean hillary said i'm her mentor well we've never had a formal relationship, but I've watched her career. She's watched mine. I've gained a lot 
from that, you know, and I remember going to the real trans annual conference, you know, and watching Sherry Chris up on stage before I got to know her real well or watching Pam O'Connor, you know, of leading RE and, and these women are now friends of mine, but just going like, oh my goodness, they're incredible, right? Because they are visible. And that's the other thing about leadership. You have to be visible. You can't lead from a closet. You know, you've got to, you've got to get out there and everybody's not going to like what you have to say. But, you know, and you have to be okay with it. You got to grow up. Embrace it. Right? Yeah. You gotta grow up. <laughs> and some people like I am, I consider it a badge of honor that XYZ doesn't like me because hmm. I don't want to have anything to do with it. whatever, you know, you just <laughs> have to. I love it. I think you have to be comfortable in your skin, confident in your message and steadfast in your beliefs. And, um, you know, before I know we're, we're running close to time, but I really want, you said something, I don't know if it was a webinar or podcast. I can't remember Leslie, but it was the lead by example. When you wanted to show your daughter that mom is working mom is doing these things. This is to be proud of and not the reverse, which is, oh, I feel bad because I'm working and I'm taking time away from my kids. Right. You know, that was right. very poignant, least much better said by you. But now that you have a granddaughter, I'm curious, how are you adapting that desire to really instill the ability or uh, confidence in a young child to accomplish what it ev whatever she wants to do? You know, I think part of it is um, supporting my daughter, Becca, who's 40 years old and works in a tech company and is traveling and just like, I just looked at her the other day and I said, Becca, you know, you've turned into me. And she goes, I know. <laughs> but just being able to kind of support what they're doing, right? And support that when dad is in charge, he's not helping mom. <laughs> he's not helping her. He's, they're a partnership and they're in this, um, in this together. So I'm very well aware. I am, I am picking my spots, although I must say that um, the latest paperback I got for her visit this weekend is called Even Martians Have Manners because I am going to be that grandma who says, <laughs> Here's how you hold a fork. Here's how you set the table. So, you know, it's it's really um, fun to um, to do that. And I'm not, you know, swimming upstream. You know, they're they're very much in the same um, thing. And you know, girls typically do well in elementary school. You know, and then things change when. Mm -hmm. The hormones kick in and all of that. So I'm I live ten minutes away and I'm gonna be really delighted to be part of those crazy years when I think you really can um, make a difference. Yeah. I wanna I wanna ask you one one thing uh, to ground it in, in today. You know, the industry right now we've just had the uh, the uh, NAR decision has just come out and we don't really don't know how that's going to lay down. You uh, said, and I have no idea where you said this, but the quote was pulled where it says, a good leader will not waste a crisis and will leverage that ability uh, right. uh, that people are showing themselves how quickly they can change. We need to change. Obviously, there's stuff going on. I, people are calling me saying the sky is falling. I have agents saying like, oh, oh, you know, should I, you know, should I get my, you know, should I join Uber now? Like whatever I'm getting from, from people. Right. If so, I don't know, crystal ball or whatever, what, what do you think leaders should be doing right now? I mean, is there anything in specific or, or just in general, whatever you got to say? I think they need to calm people down a little bit. Um, and, and you're right. Never waste a crisis. Look back at COVID. Look at how the technology adoption <laughs> in this industry that went from, we have all these tools, but I don't need them. I'm really good doing what I'm doing. Change to, I really need to learn how to do this if I'm going to. Mm -hmm to operate in the business. And as you said, this is not, um, it's not clear how this is all gonna shake out. I will say that one thing is clear and that is there will be more uh, transparency and there will be more discussions about um, remuneration and, and who pays and what the services are. And there will, I think, eventually be more, more options, you know, um, um, out there. So I would not be, 
um, afraid of this. I mean, in a certain sense, realtors are selling a, a the foundation of life, right? I mean, um, we, we all know, need a place to live. Housing. We all need yeah. a place yeah. to to live and go to go to sleep at night. So I would just kind of. Um, sit tight and keep doing what you're doing. You know, keep reaching out um, to, to clients and 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 keep learning. And and I wouldn't stop doing anything that you're doing. Let's see how this plays out. I will say that the fact that this verdict came down in less than two and a half hours tells me a lot about how the industry is perceived by the public. And I and perhaps how poor the the defense was in the situation, which I think is also worth um, um, worth discussing. But just really, um, you know, if I think I also read that the eight jurors were all renters and, you know, there's just a mm -hmm. lot of hurdles to get into housing now and people are feeling left out and behind and they look at the numbers and they look at how they pay for other things. So there's a lot at play. And I think there's a lot of opportunity for realtors to reach out to clients and, and have these discussions. So I don't want to say the sky is falling at all. I want to say the sky is going to be different. And it's 2024 almost, and it probably should be. And I, I want to, if I can, just add one more thing before, um, Absolutely. before we close. And it's really just about not ignoring the connection between your personal life and your business life and your career and how, you know, the, the, the quote from Sheryl Sandberg or, you know, is, you know, the most important career decision that you make um, is who you partner with, who you marry, who you live with, whatever that support system looks like is really, really important. And I did not have that for most of my career. I did not have the language uh, to leave. I did not have the, you know, things are talked about much more freely today than they, um, than they were in the past. And I, it's just very hard to have a successful career if you're crying on the inside. So don't ignore, you know, I remember seeing a therapist once and I was saying, you know, and I do this and I do that and I do this. And he said, Leslie, you aren't what you do. You're how you feel. And I remember, I know this sounds crazy, but I remember thinking like, what? Those feelings that I have, I should pay attention to. And he's like, yes, this is <laughs> your life. So don't ignore it. And as painful as it is to blow something up that's not working, it's even more painful to look back 30 over 30 years and go, why didn't I get happy sooner? I think we need to put an exclamation and an underline on that one because you and I have a, sh a shared story and um, I was just fortunate enough to blow it up sooner right. and get to a good point and and then the career it takes off because you are very, very happy with yourself. And um, you do need to listen to those feelings. I will, yeah. I will commend you for saying that. Thank you very much. <laughs> I've had it blow but, up twice for me. Sadly, I was still holding the package at the time. So there you go. <laughs> That's, I got my own story there. Uh, some of us are, some of us are slow, are slow learners, you know, but you know, be philosophical. And it's like every decision I made got me to today and just, be happy today. And if you're not, you know what you need to do because it's whatever you're avoiding. You need to do that. <laughs> yes. Yes. Leslie, thank you so much. Do you have any top of mind books or podcasts or recommendations for anyone that you've found fascinating recently? Well, I think from the Women Up perspective, I've been reading On Our Best Behavior, where the author takes the seven deadly sins and there's a chapter for each of them, you know, greed, lust, gluttony, and talks about the history of them and how, you know, women have kind of bitten, you know, gotten the bad end of the stick here in terms of really denying normal feelings, you know, and, and all of that. It's really a good book and there's a lot of, um, a lot of history um, behind it. And honestly, one of the greatest things about being, um, retired is having the time to uh, to read, you know, and to, um, uh, you know, I listen to Mel Robbins. I, there's so many people that I, I listen to because I actually have the time, um, the time to do it. So, yeah. 
That's wonderful. Well, Leslie Appleton Young, thank you again. We greatly appreciate your time and your expertise and your experience in sharing that with us today. It's wonderful to be here with all of you today. Thank you for having me. And we'll see you back on another episode of Own It in a week.